Hey, how's it going, friends? Thank you for tuning in to VR Revelations. Welcome once again. Please make sure you give this video a like and make sure you subscribe for future content. So, it's February 26, the year of our Lord, 2023. And I got another update here on the situation in Bakhmut. Uh, we're going to be reading from two articles here. One from DW News, which uh, I believe is a German uh, news source. Um, they are pro-Ukrainian um, and pro-Western. And then we have a more unbiased uh, report here about the same thing from War News 24-7. You can go check them out yourself on Google. Just type in War News 24-7. Now, this is a Greek website, um, and all the information here is translated uh, via the Google Chrome browser. But they usually do a pretty good job at reporting things uh, first, and also in a way that isn't, uh, you know, too biased for either side. So we'll read a little bit from uh, from this report from 24-7 News, and then uh, we'll also be taking a look at the map so that we can see uh, where exactly uh, Yahitna is, uh, which is the uh, city here. That the Russian forces uh, took control of. So let's jump back over to um, the DW article here because Ukrainian forces are act are actually denying that uh, the Russian forces, and to be more specific, the uh, um, private corporation, the Wagner Group, are the ones that made this claim of taking this town, and so. Uh, you know, the Ukrainian leadership is now saying that it's not true. Now, remember, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I would say over a month ago now, uh, the Russians took control of Solidar. So if we jump on the map, we'll see here on the Live UA map, what you can see here in the center is Bakhmut right here. You can see that uh, the red are the Russian forces. And of course, you don't have to be an expert to see that uh, Bakhmut and the soldiers in here are in a terrible position as they are pretty much surrounded uh, on all sides except from uh, the we western side of Bakhmut, which is the area or the only uh, escape route that they actually have before being uh, completely encircled. So, um, Yahitna, which the Russians just took control of, is right here to the north, as you can see here. Now, this map itself uh, is very pro-Ukrainian, and as you can see here, they have that now under Russian control, even as, as we just read there from the DW article, uh, the Ukrainian leadership is denying it. But, as I mentioned, if we move up further north, uh, Solidar was like a, uh, you know, smaller Bakhmut. It was um, a, a point of resistance, uh, a strong resistance for the Ukrainians. Um, and they fought hard, but they were overcome by the Russian forces. And... Uh, I think I was reporting on that literally like a couple of weeks before the Ukrainian leadership admitted to it. And it wasn't me, but, you know, I was just looking at these articles from these other news sources. And then uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian leadership would deny that, that the Russians had taken control of Solidar until weeks later they finally admitted and as you can see now, uh, the Russians are far past that now. So uh, I'm pretty much applying that to Bakhmut. So uh, if, if the Ukrainian leadership is denying that uh, the Russians have Yahitna, then they probably are already well past that point. Um, and as you can see here, the uh, this Ukrainian Live UA map would agree with that. So... Now, according to the uh, articles we'll see here, it's very important for the Russians um, 
that they captured Yahidna here because this is going to allow them uh, an easier access to this other town, which let me see here, um, which I believe is going to be Bohatanivka. So you have Yahidna right up here to the north, and then actually no no that's that's incorrect let me go to this other map this one actually has the uh, spellings here okay so here it is so uh, as you can see here this is Bakhmut right up here on this map is Yahidne which the Ukrainians are claiming the Russians still haven't uh, taken control of but I just showed you two maps with this one um, and they are even showing that the Russian forces are uh, or have taken control of Yahitna here. So, um, anyways, now that they have Yahitna, they're they're going to be able to take uh, Kramov here. Now, the interesting thing about Kramov here is that one of the last, really, the last road that Ukrainian forces have to get out of the center of Bakhmut is this road here, as you can see. Um, which on here is numerated 00506. Now all the other roads are now under Russian control, so the Ukrainian forces can't escape out of the city through those. Um, the One of the uh, last ones they, they had access to here was uh, this, this yellow one here, uh, 0504, this road. But now that's not even safe because you can see the Russian forces to the south of Bakhmut here are pushing uh, quite rapidly towards Chassis Yar over here, and so um, they're actually pretty close here to to this road. So that's not really an option anymore for uh, the Ukrainian forces here. So now, really, their only option here is this road. But now that Ru that the Russian forces have taken control of Yahidne here to the north. It's going to allow them to quickly move on uh, uh, Kramov here, which you can see that what that's going to do to the Russian forces. It's pretty much going to uh, trap them, right? Because if the Russian forces push from Yahidne here now to Kramov, um, the uh, uh, Ukrainian forces will they won't have any way of escape because if they try to go down here southwest, they're going to run into the forces pushing from the south already and so they either have to get out now and really that's just going to come down to Zelensky giving an order or Zelensky is going to be too proud and he's going to let his men die or uh, hopefully to the to the Ukrainian forces benefit become at the very least prisoners of war uh, but yeah the, I mean we're talking about a you know, hours and days here um, before these uh, before Bakhmut is surrounded, and it looks like this is going to be a you know multifaceted uh, sort of maneuver here to you know hit Ukraine with with a big uh, you know with a a big offensive here because. They've moving quickly here from the south of Bakhmut, surprisingly, and they're close to reaching Chassis Yar right up here, which was supposed to be like the next good defensive position for the Ukrainian forces. I believe Chassis Yar is actually higher elevated, so it's a good vantage point to attack the Russian forces once they take Bakhmut. But for a while now, the Ukrainian forces have been pushing from the south here towards Chassis Yar to cut off that capability. So really, once they uh, encircle the Ukrainian forces here and take them prisoner or destroy them, or if within the next couple of hours Zelensky gives the order uh, then uh, to move the Ukrainian forces out, then they will at least survive. Uh, but either way, it's going to be the same outcome minus the loss of life, of course. The Russian forces are going to take control of this. They'll probably want to push just as quickly to Chassis Yar here. And, uh, yeah, I think all this is just going to start collapsing in here. We'll probably see uh, an even a bigger focus next here on Zavaresk. 
And then as all this is just unfolding here, it's just going to create momentum for Russia to attack Kramatorsk and Slavyansk, which I believe uh, would uh, culminate the objectives uh, that the Russians have in this region here. But again, that might not necessarily be the end of the war since uh, Ukraine and its allies are vowing to fight until they regain all of uh, all of the land back, which would be all of this in red here. So Ukraine is claiming they're not going to stop fighting until uh, they regain all of this, which is now legally part of Russia. And the U.S. says that they're right behind them. As a matter of fact, they're actually cheering them on and preventing them from even going to the table to talk about negotiations. And so... The, you know, these are now legally part of Russia, so we're talking about a World War III scenario here, but it's not going to go that far, I don't believe. Uh, Russia is just too powerful for Ukraine. And again, the U.S. has been supporting uh, Ukraine a lot, of course, through uh, NATO. Um, but... Uh, it's not enough. They're not going all in, and that's kind of what Ukraine is hoping for. Uh, but you can see that the U.S. is just really not that confident in uh, in Ukraine. And so, again, I think that's sort of like the writing on the wall, right? That they are going to allow Ukraine to fall here to the Russians. And uh, Zelensky will probably be expelled. But anyways, let's go ahead and read a little bit more here. It says, Russian forces have so far failed to capture the village of Yehidne in eastern Ukraine as part of efforts to take the city of Bakhmut, Kiev said Sunday. The general staff of the Ukrainian armed forces contradicted the Russian mercenary group Wagner, which had claimed the capture of the village in the Donetsk region. Wagner Chief Yegeny Prigrozin said Saturday that his unit had taken Yehidne after a similar claim over the nearby village of Perkivka a day earlier. It is not possible to independently verify these claims. Uh, you know, every Western news source always says this when they're reporting on, uh, you know, Russian... Uh, Russian statements, but whenever it's Ukraine, they don't even bother. They just accept it as you know the absolute truth, which again, this is this uh, this is all propaganda. So, uh, Kiev said Russian troops were continuing their offensive around the town of Bakhmut in a war of attrition that has been going on for months. But a military statement spoke of unsuccessful offensives by Russia in six areas in Donetsk, including Barkivka and Yehidne. Although Russian troops have made progress in encircling Bakhmut in recent weeks, they have yet to take the city. That's because Ukraine has also been putting a lot of forces. They've made quite a big deal out of this city, and because of that, it's going to be a major loss uh, and a tactical error on Zelensky's part, who was actually warned by the United States a couple of weeks ago to pull his forces out of Bakhmut uh, before falling in a disastrous situation. And so he could save his forces for later, but Zelensky chose to uh, act against that counsel by the U.S. And uh, exactly what they said was going to happen is happening, so it's going to be a blunder on his part. Anyways, after the war this week moved into its second year, Dara Mazikot, a senior policy officer at the Rand Corporation, said Russian troops faced two major hurdles that they hadn't foreseen at the start of the campaign. One is Ukrainian resistance, Mazikot told CNN, adding the Russians are also unable or unwilling to interdict Western support. They're, they are adjusting a little bit, but I don't think they can overcome those larger issues. Yeah, well, it's not like they're attacking the supplies that uh, the U.S. and NATO and all these countries uh, are sending, like, you know, as soon as they enter Ukraine, right? Or even worse, as they're traveling through these other countries, such as Poland. 
but again, it's not like the it's not like the West is supplying Ukraine with everything Ukraine needs or the quantity that they're asking for, or even their best weapons to actually show true intentions of completely annihilating Russia, because you know they themselves actually fear of an escalation, as they've stated before. Um, but like I said, it just shows that uh, the West they they. They actually do understand the situation, right? That this war just is not winnable. Uh, pair of ventures, um, you know, coup in Russia where, where you know, Putin is overthrown. But, I mean, that's probably one of the least likely possibilities in all these scenarios, in my opinion. Again, Russians are proud people. They have a long history. Uh, they like their values. They like their society. And... They don't want to be ruled by the U.S., much the same way the U.S. doesn't want to be ruled by Russia or any nation that values their, you know, history and their sovereignty. Uh, but again, this is a Cold War and uh, the U.S., you know, they're the best at it, I would say, in this modern era. And they took it all the way up to Russia's borders Um and so they're just making the best out of this situation. But I think they they understand that if they were to actually pose a serious threat to Russia, right? Right on their border, this could lead to a World War III scenario where everybody loses, right? Now we sort of get into biblical prophecy, uh, which is where I personally believe all this is leading to. Uh, but again, I think the U.S. understands that that's why... They haven't gone all in. That's why they haven't given uh, Ukraine all the tanks and all these things that they actually need because they know what the outcome is actually going to be. But they're just trying to make the best of the situation as they can. However, I think that uh, they committed an error. They committed an error in all of this and they miscalculated. And I think that's sort of what puzzles people. Why are they making these decisions? The only foreseeable outcome with a war against a nuclear superpower is, you know, nuclear war, Armageddon, the end of times. But, you know, people can't seem to find any good explanation besides, you know, like the U.S.'s hatred for the uh, uh, oppressive Russian government, right? And all these ideological uh, beliefs. But personally, I think that uh, this is biblical in nature. I think God is allowing these tensions, uh, these uh, spirits where the U.S. opposes Russia and Russia opposes the U.S. and their culture and everything. And so, you know, it's all going to lead to actual biblical uh, prophecies, right? You know, if, if you believe in, in the scriptures, you understand that God is in control of all the nations, and that they uh, eventually are all working to fulfill the biblical prophecies, right, concerning the end of days. So that's sort of the uh, uh, the spiritual biblical angle that uh, I look at this whole thing with, and it makes sense to me. And again, Vladimir Putin. Uh, you know, he's he's sort of gotten very uh, spiritual as of lately in these major speeches. He starts reference, uh, he's been referencing the Bible uh, and Jesus, actually. He's quoted Jesus from the Bible. And this is something you would expect out of the U.S., right, who is a Christian nation, whether you like it or not. Just go look, go look at the population of Christians against atheists, against other religions, you know, people like to debate this, but the U.S. is a Christian nation. It says it on the dollar, and it's not talking about zoos. It's talking about Jesus Christ. That's why judges, uh, government officials mostly swear on the Bible. Um, again, it's it's no mystery that it started as a Christian Protestant nation. Um, and it's also no mystery uh, that... The modern version of the U.S. has gotten away from that, right? Uh, it calls it liberalism. Now, Russia, in contrast, they're very conservative, and the U.S. would 
describe them as oppressive because they don't allow all these type of things because, uh, you know, Russia also has a major Christian uh, population and itself is a Christian nation, but that being from the Orthodox Church. And so Vladimir Putin, you know, he's been making a lot of references to the Bible and, uh, you know, he's very aware or, or has been given has been giving this sort of underlying spiritual connotation to this whole conflict, right? And we actually get a lot of this rhetoric from uh, the, I think it's like the high orthodox priest of the orthodox church. Correct me if I'm wrong, but he's almost like the pope of the orthodox uh, church. Um, although he doesn't call himself the pope, but he's sort of like the head of all the regions of all the believers wherever you know they find themselves and so the orthodox church you know has a history of hundreds and thousands of years i believe and so um i believe this man's name is uh krill bishop krill or something like that and uh yeah he's accused the u.s of trying to uh you know corrupt russia with all their liberalism and you know he's He's obviously talked about this in a religious way where he's essentially saying this is a war between good and evil. And again, even in our modern age, what I want to point out to you is that we still can't escape these, uh, you know, the scripture, right? A lot of people would say, well, yeah, that's, that's why, you know, the scripture isn't true because all it has led to is war and destruction, but I would disagree. Uh, the Bible clearly tells us not to kill anyone, but oftentimes, as has been proven by history, people have killed innocents in the name of God. Um, but again, I would argue that those people weren't truly believers, because remember, Jesus in the Bible said, not everyone that calls me Lord, Lord, is... Uh, is my servant, right? It's the people that actually live according to the word. And so here you have these two major nations that are both calling on God, that both uh, claim to believe in Jesus Christ. Uh, we see Vladimir Putin, you know, images of him going to church there, um, praying, he wears a cross, uh, and, you know, Joe Biden himself, he's a Catholic, he's a Christian also, he believes in the Bible. So we're talking about these Christian nations fighting against each other, which again is another reminder, in my opinion, that what is going on here is in fact uh, spiritual also. Now, I'm not quite sure that Vladimir Putin is really aware of that, but he definitely seems to be more, uh, you know, more aware of the scriptures than uh, the Western leadership. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of my uh, understanding of it, right? Or the explanation I give to, to what is actually going on right now. But anyways, let's go ahead and jump over to this 24-7 uh, article here, 24-7 news article, and let's just read what they have to say about... Uh, this recent this re, this recent uh, victory for the Russian forces here in Yehidna. So it says, Today Wagner announced the total occupation of Yehidna's settlement near Bakhmut at 7 p.m. on February 25. After several days of fierce fighting, Wagner PMC fighters captured the village of Yehidna, which is a northwestern suburb of Bakhmut, Artemovsk. I believe Bakhmut is Ukrainian and Artemovsk is Russian. Uh, said Wagner PMC ahead, ahead Yevgeny Prigrozin. Remember, guys, PMC is Private Military Corporation. Uh, these are the forces, the Private Military Corporation that has been fighting along with uh, the Russian forces that really have been at the uh, forefront here of a lot of these... Uh, you know, major captures here. So it seems like they have been very effective, of course. Uh, 
they're supposedly composed of criminals and murderers and people from prison. Um, but whether that's true or not, you can't uh, deny that whoever is training them and leading them has been pretty effective with them. And regardless, they're part of the Russian forces. So the capture of the settlement of Yahidnit makes it possible to approach the last settlement controlled by the armed forces of Ukraine in this direction. The village of Kromovo, it is located on the road leading from Bakhmut to Chiziz Yar. This road is the only one still physically controlled by the Ukrainian EDs. So that is the road that I showed you guys. So if we go to this map, which actually has the names in English. So we can see here Bakhmut right here. This is where all the action is taking place right now we can clearly see here Yahidna right up here it's now under the control of the Russian forces so what this is going to allow them uh, even better than just you know giving them a different angle of attacking the forces in the center here is to actually move on to this village here of Kromov and if you look closely you can see there is a road or highway whatever it may be here but it's a road that is labeled 00506. Now this is the last actual road, um, you know, physical pavemented road here that the Ukrainian forces in the center of Bakhmut here uh, have to escape. Um, all the other roads or highways are pretty much under the control of the Russians. You can see here, again, they had access to this one on the south, but that is now too risky. So if the Russians move, they're going to start moving here to, towards Kromov. And then at that point, uh, the forces will pretty much have been encircled here. They're going to be trapped. Um, and they're either going to be killed or taken as prisoners if they actually choose to surrender. Uh, and again, it looks like this is going to lead to a major takeover of this area here all the way up to Chiziz Yar. I'm assuming, uh, again, once this actually happens here, this is going to be major news, okay? It's going to be a major victory for the Russian forces. Uh, it's definitely going to be talked about on all the uh, mainstream, uh, on all the mainstream media because Zelensky himself uh, has put a lot of manpower into Bakhmut. Of course, if it's about to collapse, it means that a lot of men have been dying there. They weren't able to make the resistance. And so it's going to be a big blunder on Zelensky's part uh, because, again, the U.S. warned him to pull out of Bakhmut uh, weeks ago, if not months ago, and he decided to double down, calling it an impregnable uh, fortress, I believe, uh, making a big deal out of it, saying that they would fight to, uh, to the end there. And so, again, that's only just going to... Uh, demoralize the Ukrainian troops and it's also going to demoralize all these other nations that uh, are supporting Ukraine right eventually they are going to realize that this war is not winnable and so uh, I think that support is pretty much already non-existent if you think about it uh, we're talking about these tanks arriving months from now and uh, Ukraine is literally in need of like thousands of tanks and artillery and jets. Not months from now, literally now. And they're only getting a couple of things months from now. So just doesn't make sense unless they understand that this uh, conflict here is not winnable unless they're looking to, uh, you know, initiate the end of the world. But, uh, yeah, let's read a little bit more here. It says, The capture of the settlement of Yahidnin makes it possible to approach the last settlement controlled by the armed forces of Ukraine in this direction. The village of Kromovo, it is located on the road leading from Bakhmut to Chiziz Yar. This road is the only one still physically controlled by the Ukrainian EDs. It should be noted that what happened significantly affects the operational situation in the entire northern sector of the front in this area. The command of the armed forces of Ukraine tried to maintain the defense of the line dubo Vasilyevka, the Ahitne Stupki railway station in Artemovsk, 
or Bakhmut. After retreating from Berkovka the previous day, however, Ukrainian troops were unable to withstand the Russian onslaught despite the transfer of additional forces. Now the garrison of the armed forces of Ukraine located in Artemovsk or Bakhmut is in a difficult position. The encirclement ring around the city shrunk significantly. So again, I'm going to leave it there, guys. But you can see here uh, that uh, Zelensky is going to have to give the order now. And it looks like he's about to suffer a major defeat here in what he called an impenetrable fortress. Anyways, that's going to be it for this video, guys. Thank you for tuning in. I am trying to make uh, more videos here. I know I've slowed down the last couple of days. But uh, my shift switched uh, in my day job, so I might be releasing these videos a little bit later in the day. But I'll try to, uh, you know, update you guys as much as I can. Uh, I sure would appreciate it if you support the video, giving it a thumbs up and subscribing, and also checking out the links below in the in the description. Thank you for tuning in. Remember, the truth is stranger than fiction. Have a wonderful day, and God bless.